Welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. I am Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. This is part two of Pediatric Simulation with Dr. Peter Weinstock. Dr. Weinstock is the Endowed Chair of Simulation and Executive Director of the Boston Children's Hospital Simulator Program and Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. Peter, we're returning now for part two. Um, in the first part, that was a wonderful overview of really the theory and the promise of simulation. But today, I think we're going to get a little more granular on really how the program works, how other programs have been developed around the world. And so thank you for returning for part two on a special edition. Great to be back. Peter, so you're describing a very flexible program, uh, and yet it's, as you, in your term, it's docking with the hospital. It's, uh, it's inserting itself into the hospital. How does that happen? So I want to use, um, to describe this, I want to use a metaphor. So I want to use a computer as a metaphor. And so in doing so, I'm going to try and simplify it down to really what um, I think are the four major components of any computer. So number one is the hardware. Number two is the firmware. And firmware is really the infrastructure of the computer. It's the, it's the software that you can't change. It's the stuff that makes the computer run. It's the basic instruction set. The third part is the software. That's the one we're so familiar with. That's the stuff you either upload or it's how you put the machine to work. And it's the basic applications of the machine. And then the last is a little more subtle, but actually the one that affects us the most, which is the platform that, this, that the computer provides. And different companies provide different platforms. And that platform is really meant to really understand the user and respond to the user. And so I want to talk about building a simulation program using that metaphor. And in particular, divided into those four components. I'm going to start with hardware. And again, we're not talking about computer hardware. We're talking about simulation hardware, but the same concept. And really, for us, hardware is about creating um, the greatest reach. And that hasn't changed since 2001. How do you build a program and the hardware of a program that's not determined by the shiniest mannequin in the room, but, but it's actually determined by the, the technology or the hardware that will, be a, that will allow you to get the simulation closest to the providers? And it also speaks a little bit to how we've developed the program from a hardware standpoint. We always talk about the program as a centralized program with a distributed footprint. And that's really critical, that you shouldn't invest too heavily in one specific type of delivery mode. Think flexibly about how you get to the patients and families, the parents, the clinicians, that audience as effectively as possible and use the hardware that'll allow you to get there. For us, we've had the fortune to have some areas that have been devoted to that, as an example. So we talked a little bit about the SIM suite that you developed many years ago. That SIM suite still exists, and we call that a SIM node, and that's over in the hospital itself. And we have a couple of nodes that exist over there, and those specifically allow us to have clinicians literally pivot into these spaces, do the simulation that they need to, take the practice wing that Seve Bolesteros takes, and go right back into their workplace environment. And we talked a little bit about in situ simulation as well as another delivery mode that's available, another type of hardware. We'd like to turn to the audience to ask a question. Please leave your reply in the comments section of this video. Do you currently use medical simulation at your institution? And if so, in what ways is it being applied? If not, where might you first apply simulation to enhance care? The headquarters that we're sitting in right now um, is quite beautiful, but I will say is quite new. So though the program is almost 17 years old now, this actual facility is only two years old. And it speaks to the importance of the infrastructure, of the ability to deliver simulation, even in low cost type of ways, without the need for something quite as large as a headquarters. Though headquarters is quite helpful in many ways. And this is our headquarters that we're sitting in currently. We've embedded within to the headquarters other solutions for our patients and family type simulations. And so we have examples uh, of, of rooms in this facility that we can easily transfer and transform using almost like Broadway technique of being able to, to put up you know, various decorative type of elements that allow the room to be completely transformed into what looks like a child's bedroom. And that allows us to apply simulation now to a new audience, to our patients and families who are perhaps going home with new technology. Patient going home on a ventilator, for example, can now 
simulate, the family can simulate what that might look like before they ever leave the hospital. And again, we're looking at stress, anxiety, reducing fear, and improving their performance as they care for their child back home. So that's hardware. It's about access, it's about reach, no matter how you invent it. Those are the focus points of hardware. The second is firmware, and we talked about that briefly, this idea of the fundamental infrastructure of your program. And what are the criterion for that? And really what it is, any good firmware is seamlessly integrated within the computer. You, you don't notice it, actually. It just makes the computer run. And surprisingly, for us, the firmware is not a bunch of technology. It's actually more important than that. Our firmware are our faculty. Our firmware are the greater than 300 faculty that we've trained over the last 10 years that now deliver simulation through a specific standardized type of approach throughout the hospital. And there are firmware. Uh, of what we do on a regular basis. The second part of our firmware is we have a programming language. And many programs now have developed various ways to think about simulation delivery. And most importantly, any programming language like this has to refer to the idea that one type of simulation is not like another, and it's not a one-sized-fits-all. There's this concept of Bloom's taxonomy. And Bloom's taxonomy grows from knowledge acquisition all the way through synthesis and even teaching of that knowledge at the ultimate pinnacle. And we've developed curricular programming languages, so to speak, that allow us to create the right curriculum for the right learner at the right time. It's almost like taking Bloom's taxonomy and tilting it onto its side. And that's uh, what we call sim zones, these zones of teaching, depending on how you want to use simulation uh, and, and how you want to teach and to who you want to teach. You know, Jeff, a lot of people talk about um, really fundamental to the whole process, and we even talked about it earlier, this reflective practice, this opportunity for, for reflection, that actually simulation is often thought about as an excuse to debrief, and that the real money's in the debriefing. Um, and I couldn't agree more, actually. Um, so part of your program is building this debriefing engine, trying to um, understand what debriefing method you're going to use, and being able to build faculty that can utilize it. And we call that our debriefing engine. And, We've built that here at Boston Children's as well. Uh, in mo many of our international programs, we have roadmaps for debriefing that really take apart the anatomy of a good conversation, so to speak, um, and teach and allow the faculty to be able to walk these participants through a very productive conversation. We call that our molecule or, or our debriefing methodology. But the truth is that, I'll say this almost as an aside, debriefing itself is not difficult. In fact, I always say that it's actually quite easy in its most fundamental piece. Um, and that is that when I walk in and I see a debriefing going well versus when I see one that's not going well, the differentiating factor might surprise you. <laughs> but it has to do with that the debriefer fundamentally does not love the learner. And I know that may sound soft, <laughs> but it's actually true. And I know as an educator you feel that. that when, in order to be a great educator to your students, you have to fundamentally love them. That education is one of the most intimate things we do. It's like we feed our children and we house them and, and we teach them. Um, and so our participants want to feel that. Um, and so if I had to give feedback to a, bad, to a debriefer who has not done a great job, or they feel it, they know it, often that's what I'll say. I'll say, did, did you love the people that you walked in to debrief? And they'll often honestly say no. So it's just an aside, but um, really taking debriefing, which is, can be thought of and is, can be quite complex as a science, down to its fundamentals, I think uh, we've got to love our learners. We'd like to return to the audience again for another question. Again, please leave your reply in the comments section. What method or methods are you currently using to debrief your simulations? So let's talk about software. And what I mean by that is really creating um, a language or a very intuitive user interface of applications um, for, for your participants or for your users. And here we've kind of stolen a little bit from the idea of an office suite or a suite of applications, and we've converted them. Um, so what might be Office and Word and Excel, we've, we've transformed that into the simulation version. And we think about it as major adaptations of simulation, uh, testing what we call sim test, uh, training, sim train, networking, or sim network, and then engineering, uh, what we call sim engineering. 
And each of those are the major adaptations of simulation that you might pull off the shelf to apply to a burning platform and to a critical need of the institution or a department or a division. Uh, well, Peter, uh, I, I like the metaphor of a computer, you know, the hardware, uh, the firmware being what the faculty are, the software, teach, train, et cetera, depending on which app, I guess, you're using, as it were. But um, tell me more about the platform. What do you mean by that? The platform for us really is the ultimate um, manifestation of being a reflection of the institution. So when you take all the applications like training and testing and networking and all of that, how we apply them is really in response to what the institutional needs are. And in so doing, it creates really a, almost an ecosystem of simulation activities that are going on that are satisfying and addressing those challenges. And we call that our platform. And at any point, we can adjust that platform to be responsive again. We, we sometimes call the platform the reflective surface of the institution. So let me take you through a little bit of what that platform looks like. And we said earlier, we talked earlier about the importance of this psychologically safe foundation at the bottom of this so-called pyramid or platform. And that hasn't changed. And so we continue to really reinforce the psychological safety of the platform. As you move up the platform, much like the way the institution thinks, as you move up the platform, you're talking about hospital-wide initiatives. Appli applying simulation to achieve change at the hospital-wide level. And as you move up, you are approaching more and more an individual patient. And that's how I'm going to build it. And that's how we think about this platform, because that's very much the way the institution thinks about how they care for kids. Make the institution strong, build it in a strong, with a strong foundation, and then ultimately apply our principles directly to that individual child and their family. So level one for us is that kind of training which for us is skills, orientation training, in-servicing, basically workforce expansion and retention. And that's a large-scale effort, hundreds of courses that run each year, and it's really focused on each of the department's divisions and to nursing and allied health. Level two, again, approaching the patient a little closer. Level two for us is our environmental work, and that's pulling from the SIM test application, so to speak. And the environmental work is really bringing simulation into environments to understand how they work, are they safe, do they work optimally, and how can we improve them? Either in their current state, or potentially as we're about to build them, as I've mentioned, in these cardboard reproductions that you might use simulation uh, to achieve. Level three for us is getting even closer to the patient. Now we're working with the individual teams. We're doing team training, human factors training. And we're using these as opportunities to tune up much like Formula One racing, to tune up those teams, whether they're surgical, medical, to perform in their optimal way when they deliver care to that patient. And that may be around a generic case, or it might be around a very specific case um, for those individuals. We've expanded some of that to include rapid response simulations, and that's where the root cause analysis work starts to come in. So now we can dovetail team training, systems analysis, because the team training is happening within the environment, and also unpackage an actual event to understand how we might improve care moving forward. And that all occurs in level three for us, and that pulls from the applications SIM train and SIM test, as an example. Level four is an exciting area that we're just embarking on, which we call real. Real is real event analysis and learning. And there are centers now across the country and internationally that are looking at backing the mannequins out using the same methodologies, but applying them to real live video capture. And it's interesting to see how simulation programs are being seen as often the experts in this field because of their long heritage in safe structured environments and debriefing methodologies from crisis events, we're starting to explore that as well. And so that we call real, and that's level four because it's even closer to actual patients themselves because those are real cases. And level five for us is something we call SIM 4D. And it's really a bit of a glimpse into the future. And it's where we apply technologies like 3D printing and special effects. And we actually build the actual patients or the relevant anatomy of those patients. And we apply the entire pyramid to those patients in either a team training moment or in a skills training moment, i.e. 
doing the surgery before the surgery concept. And that's level five. Now, all of what I've described, I've put within the conceptual framework of how we apply that to a clinical environment. But this can all be flipped 180 degrees to our patients and families. Each of these levels, whether they're skills training, environmental testing, meaning optimizing the home environment, team training, patients and families with their home providers, or real life type of training, we can apply to our patients and families as part of what we call our preparing you division of what we do. And that's the platform in a nutshell. Peter, I wonder if we could turn now to um, what you call sim engineering. And I, I must say, you know, uh, watching this program evolve over 17 years, I never imagined that simulation would be part of helping the hospital engineer a safer, more effective environment, and then moving beyond that to engineering through 3D printing. Tell us about how that started and where is sim engineering? You know, I'll have to give credit, actually, to um, some of my early engineers. Uh, as you remember, um, many, many years ago, we hired our first engineer um, who had um, some interest and background in actually building things, um, not just running simulators. Um, and I remember him um, sitting in his small um, control room, and, uh, and he was toying around with silicon and was being able to do some onlay trainers, some little wound trainers, and I was watching that. And I said, there's something there. And uh, he felt that way too, uh, particularly uh, where we were in terms of mannequin availability and what uh, mannequins were capable of doing, particularly from a surgical standpoint, procedural standpoint. And so that slowly started to evolve into, when we had a second uh, engineer come on board, um, a little more sophisticated type of exploration. So now those things were a bit more layered. Um, there was more components and parts to them. Uh, and then um, one of our engineers came to us about five or six years ago and said, you know, we've been building these things by hand. And, you know, there's this industry of 3D printing that seems to be evolving. And I'm wondering whether we should try to do that. So we put an application together and put a proposal together. And we're fortunate enough to get that funded. Um, and we brought a 3D printer into the program. And that really caused things to skyrocket for us. Um, but it started with that natural curiosity and also not being satisfied with the status quo. We had a small lab that was, a little lab space that was created for us because they could only build so much on their laps. Um, and before we knew it, we had what we now call our sim engineering space or sim engineering studio. And the concept here is to really just continue to push the boundaries of where we are. So if we really believe that there is a benefit to a practice swing, imagine if we really could create the practice swing on the very anatomy of the very patient that we're going to be operating on or that we're going to be caring for. Whether that's a complete recreation of the physiology through artificial intelligence and machine learning and technologies like that, or it's actually the technical anatomy through special effects, 3D printing, and a lot of creativity, the concept is how realistic can we make this to have the greatest impact on this particular child. So that was at least the theory that we went into this with or the challenge we provided for ourselves. So the engineering facility really is the manifestation of that. And what it contains are some really talented individuals who are, have backgrounds in some 3D printing and imaging. Um, some background in robotics and some animatronics, and they're really building trainers in response to the needs of the institution of the individuals who are, re who are requesting this type of training. We've discovered some interesting elements of this. We've treated this as a science. And so we went ahead and, and did some studies looking at what's the impact of doing a um, preview rehearsal on a 3D printed model, um, simulating. Uh, the various anatomies. And we published uh, recently a paper where we were able to show not just reductions in OR times, anesthetic times, um, but also reductions in complication rates um, from the ability to, to have the chance to rehearse. So we're combining this now with a much larger story, which is um, not only do we have some biometrics that tell us something about reductions in fear and anxiety and stress improving performance, but we're seeing now that the rehearsal of the clinical skill one, two, or three times ahead of time actually saves time in the operating room and anesthetic time, real quantitative measurements of, of metrics or benchmarks 
of how we think about medicine more broadly. We've even engaged some special effects artists, uh, both in our own program and in Hollywood, and we've created some pretty realistic mannequins to allow neurosurgeons to practice new types of approaches and procedures. Uh, so this complements well innovations in surgery, because as we innovate in surgery and we create new procedures, we need training mechanisms to teach that generation and the next generation how to do this new technique. Um, so we've partnered very closely with our, our clinicians. It's another element, um, as I describe your sort of quick start guide, that, that connection between a simulation program and their clinicians um, is really critical. Uh, physicians, nurses, um, having that sort of cohabitation of uh, clinicians and simulation specialists and maybe even some engineers, if available, creates this almost turbo boost of innovation around uh, both education but also around the technology that accompanies it. Um, so we're very excited about what's happening in the engineering space and it's really a glimpse into the future, I think, of where simulation could go. Peter, that's fascinating and I, I agree. I think that's a, a glimpse of the future and apparently the future is now especially using 3D printing from an MRI image and handing that to the operating surgeon who can practice and practice and practice. And now you, know, you have the, your manuscripts coming out demonstrating safer, more efficient uh, care and, and apparently with better outcomes. In a way, that's not astonishing. But I wonder if we could turn now to something else that you've done. Um, you were uh, one of the founders of the International Pediatric Simulation Society. And um, I've been very impressed at how um, these global centers work together. Could you tell me how you did that? And I remember almost a dozen years ago, uh, your first partnership was, was in Florence, Italy, as I recall. But now there's uh, some dozen centers around the world. Tell us about that process. How did it work? Uh, how could others possibly be, be involved in this? Yeah, from the very beginning, um, as, you can, as you can tell, we were, we were very um, almost obsessed with the process by which simulation could be built. And a lot of this came back to my initial interest in design and programmatic development. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about um, how to develop these programs, and we kind of wrote it all down um, and developed essentially um, some standard operating procedure and some process uh, around how do you get this up and running and how do you do this in this way. And we had the fortune to um, do the ultimate test of this, which was to really look and see um, whether these processes, i.e., you know, some of the SIM trains, SIM test applications, the idea of the pyramid or the platform or ecosystem could be installed and transferred um, into other cultures, uh, adapted to other languages, um, to see whether that, that could happen, not just in Boston. Uh, but in areas around the world. Um, so yeah, we were fortunate to partner very early with uh, Florence, Italy, the Meyer Children's Hospital, um, partnered uh, in the UK and a variety of other places. Um, and what we tried to show is that we could um, take about 17 years of experience um, and, and focus on the process by which we did this and some of our um, quick start guide principles and see whether we could get the same rapid launch uh, within a uh, two to three year period. Um, and we've been um, quite successful at being able to do it. And what this has amounted to is actually an installation system uh, that we've developed that takes these standard operating procedures, takes these approaches, takes the approach to infrastructure development, faculty development, and puts it and packages it into a way that we can um, do this within a set period of time. Um, and what we've shown really is that we can do it in about two to three years uh, as an installation. And we have been able to do this now on um, about five or six continents uh, around the world, where now they're using elements of a sim train type of approach or a sim test type of approach in order to build their centers locally. And have accelerated that process, um, again, from several decades uh, down to two to three years uh, for many of these institutions. So we're excited about that and excited to see where that's growing. As a result, as you mentioned, many of those institutions have gotten to know each other. Um, and early on, um, much of the society kind of grew out of institutions that were getting to know each other through a lot of this early work of sharing ideas, uh, sharing methodologies, and thinking deliberatively around the process such that we could all be ready to go from SIM 1.0 to 2.0 as the future approached us. Um, so I'm excited to see that piece of it uh, occurring as well. And again, we'd like to turn to the audience now to get your thoughts. 
What have been your greatest operational successes and challenges for your simulation efforts at your institution? And who are your key stakeholders? Peter, the, uh, the description of the development of, your, uh, of the global network is, is just really wonderful. In a way, it's classic to all good you know, research or consortiums where you reach out and collaborate because no one's got a lock on knowledge and you want to share best practices. But you, um, you went out and did it, which is a wonderful thing. And that network is truly global and, and truly connected. So that's a phenomenal uh, accomplishment. Um, but I wonder if we could turn now to, um, as we wrap up here, how do you put all this together? Um, yeah, I am very familiar with this program uh, since you and I work together but it's almost dizzying uh, in, its, in its components now. Um, is, there, is there something that brings this together for you in your own mind, a particular case? Yeah, I'd love to share one. Um, it, it's a nice example um, because it's an example of where um, really clinical service partnership, which we touched on earlier, um, and high reliability catalyzation, you know, really is brought to the forefront um, and where the program can play a role like that. I will caution that this case that I want to talk about does have some of the technology side of things as well. It's going to get us to level five. Um, but I think it's worthwhile, though, just to see the whole gamut. Um, but to realize that each part of this case is built on every level, from workforce expansion, good in-servicing around skills, understanding environments well, understanding teams well. Um, all of that ecosystem is brought to bear on these cases, each of them. But I thought I would show you one that really includes um, them all from start to finish. And it's the case of um, a young child um, who was born actually outside of Massachusetts, um, but was um, born with um, a, a defect called an encephalocele, um, which I know you're very familiar with. Um, and these are large defects that, um, cranial defects, that um, often it contain either CSF, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, or brain uh, contents, and can often be very tricky to repair uh, because of those contents. So much so for, for this child uh, that the family really did look far and wide for a surgeon and a surgical team that, they, that would be willing to, to operate. Um, but as you can see from the extent of the, of the defect, um, this was a very, very risky procedure, particularly a very risky procedure to go into um, without um, um, any additional preparation, or just a standard approach. And so not surprisingly, it was very difficult to find a surgical team. They did call Boston Children's. And um, to my delight, um, the ch chairman of uh, both neurosurgery and plastic surgery called the simulator program. So this is moving from 1.0 to 2.0. This is clinical service partnership. They called me up and they said, um, you know, we have this case and I wonder if simulation could help us here. Um, if it could help us prepare, if, could, if it could help us design, if it could help us iterate and understand the feasibility of this surgery before we ever put this patient on a plane. And I always use the Jerry Maguire line, you had me at hello. Um, and so, of course, the answer was yes. And uh, we embarked on this project together. And so what we did is employ um, the sim engineering facility. And I brought those guys to bear, and they all started to study the anatomy of this young child. They took the MRI scans, the CT scans, level 5 type work, uh, and they went ahead and started to reproduce this child's anatomy from the neck up. They used uh, 3D printing. They used some, a little bit of special effects, um, some surface scanning. And what they provided to the surgeons was not just a 3D print, but they also could provide imaging in virtual reality space that allowed the surgeon to see what some of the an anatomic underpinnings uh, of, this, uh, of this deformity were, as well as a 3D print. And so the surgeons went to work looking at these imaging, feeling the different prints, and went ahead and iterated the surgery in a variety of different ways, and ultimately came up with the most feasible surgery technically. And this was an approach where you had to take apart, basically, the cranium into various parts and label them, remove those parts, put the brain back where it needed to be, the cerebral spinal fluid, and I know I'm simplifying this case tremendously, but bear with me. And then they were able then to put those pieces of the cranium back together. So it was a staged approach in that way. And they brought this uh, training device, really, uh, to the simulated operating room, and they were able to rehearse 
uh, and look at feasibility, not just from a skills standpoint, but would this actually play out well uh, in the operating room? And they could do this as many times as they needed to. And ultimately, I'll never forget when they called up uh, the team and they said, okay, you can put the patient on a plane. And we did that, and, um, and the patient's outcome was enormously successful. Not only were we able to fix the defect, uh, but they were able to get the patient safely back to the ICU for a very short stay. Uh, we imagined this to be 10, 14, 15 hours of surgery. It was cut essentially in half. Um, their time in the ICU was cut down dramatically, and their time with a breathing tube. Uh, we expected many, many days. The patient was extubated within a day or two uh, in the ICU. I actually was the ICU doctor to admit this patient coincidentally, so it was really very satisfying to see that happen. So this is seeing the whole SIM 2.0 come to bear, um, both on the team, on the institution, and then ultimately to have that impact, it really to make the impossible possible uh, for a patient um, with a great outcome. So I think it's a great case uh, to summarize what we've talked about. Well, you said your focus was why, and uh, I think that answers the question pretty well. Um, so Peter, I know I speak for colleagues around the world uh, for your leadership and the leadership of many others in your field of pediatric simulation, uh, for all that you've done and, and you are doing to make, uh, to make us better at what we do. So thank you for sharing your thoughts today. Thanks for having me, Jeff.